what are you are you a student yeah. undergrad? Yes. Okay, and what are you studying? Uh, uh, I'm engineering, but I took all the Japanese language courses here. Got it. All right, great. So since we don't have a lot of people here, I really encourage you guys to jump in um, in kind of a conversational way if you have anything to contribute or any questions to ask. I wanted to, to I, I did this project about two years ago, and um, I'll tell you about it, that's what the whole talk is basically about. But it's, it came out to be a pretty helpful little tool, which is why I wanted to share it with y'all. So today we're going to be talking about this problem, right? The problem of listening comprehension in a foreign language classroom. The problem might be strong if you don't like that word, think of it as a different word in your head. Um, a solution, not the only one, but one option. And then I'm going to talk to you about the creation of the materials that go along with my idea for a solution, as well as the uses of those materials. So the problem, if we're listing it in three different um, points, is that listening comprehension is regarded as difficult among many of our students. It's the part of exams that make them the most nervous. It's the part of um, it's the part of exams that students tend to do most poorly on um, if they are struggling to begin with. Another part of this, another piece of this, is that the listening comprehension is a skill that's hard for us to observe because we can't see what's happening from a student's perspective. They're not speaking, so we can't point and say, okay, that word right there, that's where you're losing the person with whom you're speaking. We can't look at their writing and say, this is the verb form right here that's throwing you off. We, don't, we can't really tell what's going on in their mind from listening comprehension. Um, there's a little bit more about that that I want to talk about later, but the basic idea is that you can't see it. Um, and then finding audio texts. Now, if we're, I'm not talking about face-to-face -face conversations. I'm talking about, I'm going to play an audio for y'all, and y'all are going to listen to that audio and see what you understand. I'm going to ask some questions about it. But finding audio texts are hard, right? Because sometimes if it's exactly what we want, maybe it's a news story from the real world, as far as the relevance to the curriculum, as far as the authenticity of it, this is really coming from the real Spanish-speaking world, it's great, but it's super inaccessible language-wise. So a lot of times these are thrown off of balance. Sometimes if something's very accessible, it's ridiculously easy and forced or over-scripted. So these three, accessibility, authenticity, and relevance, things are kind of at, in a constant tension when I'm looking for audio texts to use in my classroom. So, I started thinking about this um, when I first started working as a lecturer in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. And just starting to think in the highlighted green, how do we begin working with this issue? Right? So OK, it's regarded as difficult. So because students are having trouble with that, it's our responsibility as teachers, as educators, to figure out how to incrementally support them with this skill. But you can't observe it, and that's hard. Well, OK, obviously, somehow we need to make it visible. We need to figure out what students are doing when they're listening so that we can figure out where they're getting tripped up. And then uh, finding audio texts that are both accessible and authentic is hard, and so we need to figure out where the compromise is. And that compromise between the hyperscripted, the very slow, very student-centered, maybe created for a language classroom, forced audio. We need to figure out how to make that um, have a compromise with maybe the very real world, but a little too fast language that we see out there, um, maybe like on a, a television station or whatnot. So identifying a compromise, excuse me, I need to get some water. Identifying a compromise might actually be reconsidering what counts as authentic. Because historically, right, authentic is that which is produced by the community that speaks this language, produced by and for that community. Maybe we need to shift that a little bit, um, which is a whole other presentation and a whole other talk. But for now, I'll say the obvious solution, right, is that we, um, we create our own recordings in-house um, and we have proficient Spanish speakers, such as Sandra here, who helped me out with one of these recordings, um, interact naturally about actual course content, right? So I take Cassie, I take Sandra, I say, okay, in our course we talk about la tecnología y el estrés, we talk about technology and stress. 
here's a question about it. Have a conversation. All right, so we make, we make an audio recording. Great. So all of a sudden, it is highly relevant. And what you guys are going to see is I put tools in place to make it as accessible as I can. And then the question of authenticity. Well, we made it in-house. We made it for students. That doesn't mean it's authentic, does it? Well, OK, what is authentic? Right? And again, that's a different talk for a different time. But if something is authentic in Spain, because it was on TV one day in 1996, and then I somehow take the video and put it in my Spanish classroom 21 years later, is it still authentic? Or did I somehow transplant that artifact into its wrong environment, rendering it kind of not the same thing it was at one point? So is it more authentic then to actually be talking about actual class content if that's what the class is about, right? Um, so so re-examining kind of our hang-ups on what authentic is and whether it even matters or not is another avenue for another presentation another day. But it, since it is what I do, uh, since it is what it is what I do academically, I, uh, I have a lot of passion around that. So the way this solution is different from just recording in-house this one conversation is that it ends up having three different versions. Okay, so I'm going to explain it in a moment, basically by telling you how I created it, because that'll be the easiest way to explain it. But generally speaking, there's an advanced version that's unscripted, and then there are two scripted versions that are an intermediate version and a basic version. Right? So the difference is, well, actually, just let me explain. I'm going to get ahead of myself. Can you guys read that? Mm -hmm. Here, I, I won't read it aloud, just as long as you can you read it back there? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll let you guys take, take a second to read it to yourselves. So um, basically, I think what happens a lot of times is that in the real world, we have a, say, a news story. Right? And I say news story because a lot of times we select things where naturally there is, it is a one-sided, I'm talking to you audio text, as opposed to an interaction. Um, but so say I choose a news story, right? I get it from the real world, maybe it's exactly what I want, maybe it's relevant to the course, maybe it's accessible linguistically, um, maybe it's authentic, right? Um, but maybe I know that for some students it's not quite accessible, and I wish there were a slightly easier version of that. Since I didn't make that original newscast in-house, I don't have a way to create an easier version of it that really truly resembles it. So here, by making and we, so basically, I called so call two graduate students and I had volunteers, um, and they recorded an unscripted conversation. So all of a sudden, I have like three minutes of chat, right, between two speakers, dealing with, for those of you guys who have taught 610, dealing with one of the course topics, actually an odd lab question, usually, for those of you guys who have taught 610. And then I say, thank you, grad students, go ahead, go and leave. And then I sit down with the audio and I transcribe it. And I listen to it and make sure I have an identical transcript to what the audio is. So all of a sudden, that first audio, that's the, an advanced version, and the script is the advanced script. But then I'm like, okay, I'm going to take this script, and I'm going to make two more levels. Okay? I'm going to make one easy, super easy, as easy as I can, and one in the middle between the original one and the super easy one. And then I have three scripts, but I only have one recording. So I call the same graduate students back in. I say, hey, can you guys please record these two scripts based on your original conversation? And all of a sudden, I have three versions. So um, this is based on uh, Walter White's, uh, one of his rants in Breaking Bad. But because I knew I would, we wouldn't have only Spanish here, I wanted to give you guys an idea of, so Walter White originally says, do you know how much I make a year? I mean, even if I told you, you wouldn't believe me. 
Do you know what would happen if I suddenly decided to stop going to work? A business big enough that it could be listed on the NASDAQ goes belly up, disappears, ceases to exist without me. So I don't know Walter White personally. Um, I don't know Brian Cranston personally, so I can't ask him to create two more versions. I do know Walter Whitehead, that's my dad. <laughs> FYI. Um, but so I can't I can't ask him to create two different versions, so this isn't ideal, but I just want to show you. I say, okay, maybe I call White Walter White back in if I did know him. I say slow this down a little bit, and I want you to change these few words. Maybe changing a you wouldn't to a you won't. I am not a good, um, I'm not, I'm not highly trained in ESL, so my guesses to do with what I would change in an English script are guesses. What I changed in the Spanish scripts are much more, um, are much more well informed, right? So these are my guesses to what maybe an ESL person would decide to change. Then maybe in the basic one I say, okay, Walter White, you need to really slow it down, pronounce every single syllable. Uh, and I want you to add these words, not do you know how much I make a year, but do you know how much money I make in a year? So that it would be almost impossible for somebody who really knows this grammar to not follow. Right? Do you guys get the idea? Are there questions on the idea? Yeah, I mean, for me, the difficulty in this step is the cultural mm -hmm. concept. So, not the grammar, but I don't know what is the N A S. <laughs> yeah, and I don't really know what it is either. And actually, it's funny because when I was thinking about, and I don't really, the NASDAQ, there's a big company in the stock index. exchange. It's the, the stock index. exchange. Yeah. What is it? It's the index on the stock exchange. It's the index on the stock exchange. I didn't really know that either, to be honest. See? Mm -hmm. But I was actually playing with saying a huge, like a company that's as big as a company could be. I almost changed it to that too, so that's interesting you caught that. But, um, yeah, so that's the thing. I mean, culturally, that is interesting, so I haven't thought, that, that's a new avenue, I guess, to look at all of this, because there's probably things in the scripts that I didn't adjust for a cultural thing, and then how do I do that? How should I do that? Um, as far as, like, I don't want to stray away from the original cultural assumptions with which things were originally spoken. So these are just some ideas. Um, or some basic ideas of the different versions. It's not a science, it's more of an art of me looking at the original one and saying, okay, how easy can I possibly make this? And then finding it in between. So you guys see that the advanced is unscripted, we already know that, the other two are scripted. The advanced is totally natural, spontaneous speech. The only thing I told my grad students was remember you're being recorded. Because we want to make sure we're speaking so that anyone who's listening to the recording who's a native speaker or a proficient speaker would be able to understand well. Um, here we're having them read at a natural and steady pace, pronouncing off syllables. Some do that better than others, but, but I mean, that's the nature of it, right, as far as how people are reading in their own language. And then reading at a slow pace. These sometimes sound ridiculous. When I show these to my grad students at the beginning of the semester as an option, they a lot of times laugh at how slow this version sounds. And then, as far as the content goes, most of it is, there's no direction here. I don't say use this verb tense and don't use this one. I don't see it, say if you use vos, which is the form used in some parts of Central and, and uh, Latin America, I, I don't tell you to, to avoid it. Uh, idiomatic expressions, pronunciation, whatever, however you speak normally is fine. Right? Now, here, I adjust some of it. Some idiomatic expressions I take out. If it seems like it would really mess with student understanding, I don't take them out completely, I change the way I say them, right? Um, some forms of verbs that students haven't learned, some vocab, and then this is most, most of the stuff that could possibly throw a student off is really simplified. Are there questions on that? I'm gonna give you guys, I'm gonna show you guys uh, so, because I know uh, not everyone here is uh, related to Spanish um, as a language, I didn't want to give you guys too much to work with, but these are three versions of the first part of one conversation. So even as far as length goes, if you guys can see that this is the basic version, oh, it's a PDF, I can't highlight. If you guys can see that this is a basic version indicated in line four, 
there's about five lines, and then the intermediate version down here, right, all of a sudden is seven lines, and then the avanzado, the advanced one, is also seven lines, right? So generally speaking, the basic ones get shorter, but they maintain the ideas. So um, let me actually play one for you, and those of you guys who don't know Spanish, I'm not going to play the whole thing, I just want to make sure you guys, are, you guys will probably be able to hear the difference. Um, so I'm actually going to start with the advanced one, which, is, which isn't an easy, let's see how this goes. You're going to need to turn that on, Ava. Over here. <laughs> yeah. For some reason I was thinking that was the, uh, I don't want it to blast. Okay, un tema sobresaliente importante la tecnología. Yo lo hablo con mis estudiantes y les pregunto, ¿cuándo fue la última vez que vieron a un estudiante de UT sin su iPhone? Mm -hmm. Nunca, dice, nunca. ¿Vos tenés algo así, una adicción a la tecnología? Ah, bueno, me gustaría decirte que no, porque, porque me parece malo, no me gusta la idea de una adicción. En general no, pero cada tanto sí, cuando estoy en momentos con mucho estrés, sí. Veo que quiero, so quiero that algo. right there is just the beginning of him saying, hey, do you have an addiction to technology? I see a lot of students who do. And she's like, yeah, like sometimes I do. Right? So we're going to slow it down and just listen to the first part of this one. This is the intermediate one. You'll see it gets slightly easier. OK, un tema importante, la tecnología. Yo lo hablo con mis estudiantes y les pregunto, ¿Cuándo fue la última vez que vieron a un estudiante de UT sin su iPhone? Nunca me dicen, nunca. ¿Vos tenés una adicción a la tecnología? Bueno, me gustaría decirte que no, porque no me gusta la idea de tener una adicción. En general no, pero a veces sí, en momentos estresantes sí. sí. A veces quiero algo y... Versus the basic, which if I remember correctly, this one isn't one of the most ridiculously accessible basic ones. But you'll see this change as well. La tecnología es un tema importante. En mi clase les pregunto a mis estudiantes, ¿cuándo salen de sus dormitorios sin sus iPhones? Nunca, dicen, nunca. ¿Tú tienes una adicción a la tecnología? Ah, bueno, quiero decirte que no, porque no me gusta la idea de tener una adicción. En general no, pero en momentos estresantes, sí. sí. A veces que... So, here, and I don't want to go too far into this because I want to make sure we're sticking with the idea instead of the actual language content, but the idea is that we're just shifting little things to maintain the conversation, to maintain the integrity of it, um, while offering students three different opportunities to kind of understand what's going on. Questions or comments? Just, uh, Sarah, I don't see the difference between the simple, the basic, with the intermediate. What is is pretty much the same? Yeah. Or, or what, what is the, the objective for, for the first one and the second one? Just adding some more information that maybe will complicate a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, taking away more information because it's coming from the most complicated one to begin with. Or, but, uh, or, or adding to the second one information. Well, the second one, no information is added because only information is taken away. Because the first conversation is the real one, is the advanced one. So that's the one I start with. So everyone, I take, I take away a little bit for the intermediate. I take away more for the basic. Um, but so this one, so a few things on that is that it's, it was hard figuring out what to show people because this is only like 10 to 12 lines of one conversation that's actually closer to 70 lines. So all of the biggest changes, you're not necessarily going to see them super clearly just out of this excerpt. But um, as a non-native speaker, I do think the basic one is read more slowly. That one's more accessible. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, um, okay. But also, little things like here, Ignacio, in the second one, sorry, come on, Google Docs. 
Um, in the second one, this vos tenes, he was still using vos tenes. Uh -huh. And then in the That's basic one, ones, it's tienes. So like little things like that um, do shift. But you would see it, if you saw the whole script, you would probably be able to see the character of it shift a little bit more. And some are better than others. Some, so as far as how I was able to work with the conversation, right? Some feel like they're more successfully um, kind of graduated than others. Yeah, but you write the piece, and I didn't, I didn't get back with the piece that they're talking uh, in the first one to, to the second one makes the difference. I was playing an hour today to my students. It was, it was a very simple, but it was fast. So I played it just slow. And then they say, oh, we understand. Just, just that makes a lot of difference yeah. with our students yeah. that are learning the language. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. the way they're processing it, it seems like a lot of times um, what ends up happening is they get, because of the anxiety level also, they get thrown off if they don't understand one thing. And then they miss the whole sentence. Mm -hmm. So you, you little simple things like vos tenes instead of tu tienes could uh, potentially result in that. So, so these materials are like a corpus of sorts. It's like they're like a text um, in and of themselves. It's not. It's not a set of activities. It's a set of um, data, for lack of a better word, um, that y'all can use in your classes, and that I use in my classes in a bunch of different ways. It depends on my students, it depends on my objectives, et cetera, et cetera. But before we get into that, um, th these are some of the variables um, that basically determine how I'm going to use these. Right? Do the students have access to the scripts? Right? Or are we just using audio? Or maybe we hear the audio first and then they see the script. Maybe they read a script first and then do a different activity for 15 minutes and then go to the audio and see if the script you know, from before helps them. There's so many different ways to manage that. Breadth versus depth. Are we using advanced, intermediate, and basic? Are we using two of them? Are we using only one of them? Are we using a whole conversation or just selected lines? Um, the progression of that difficulty. Do we start with basic and say, okay, do you understand this? Okay, let's go to intermediate. Okay, you understand that? Let's go to advanced. Or do we start with advanced, figure out what's throwing them off, and then have them go figure out the answers in the other scripts? Yeah. Sarah, you, you what's the test? Um, do they have questions for the test? Or just you ask, do you understand this? Just this? Or? Yeah, we'll talk about that. There's, um, yeah, there's, there's more. So this is, these are just variables. Uh, and in a second, we'll talk about the different, different like, activities, if there are questions or prompts, that kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. Um, so the, I really like starting with the advanced one, because I, I think it really shows students, like, whoa, like, this is, like, it overwhelms them a little bit. But I say, don't worry, you'll be overwhelmed. But like, the part of the lesson that's coming up is we're going to work through this. Instead of just saying, OK, listen, listen to this. You have it twice. Answer your questions. We're going to go over it now. Okay, listen to how hard this is. I'm going to work with you guys on it for 20 minutes, and then we're going to listen to the advanced version again and see the difference in how well you understand. Um, so, and then in class versus at home, I have these on my Canvas site. Students know they're there. Um, I have four for the entire course, um, and I use them sometimes, and sometimes I don't, but students know they're there if they want to use them at home. Okay, so what can I do with these activity-wise? So it depends on your learning objective. And these are not mutually exclusive, of course, but um, it's a matter of really what are we trying to do? Do we want to make sure they're understanding the gist of the conversation? Super common in the exams that we have in Spanish and Portuguese. Do we want them to be able to identify and discuss variations between levels? There's no reason why the vos tenes, tu tienes decision on my part shouldn't be part of the actual curriculum in our classes. That's a kind of a reflective grammar awareness thing. And then meta awareness. Okay, so you understand this, this uh, audio clip this time, great. What has let you under, to understand it that you can apply to the next time you listen to a totally different audio clip? And helping students to cultivate that awareness so that they can actually become better listeners. So I have a few activity 
and uh, lesson ideas for each of these types of objectives. They're not by any stretch the only thing you could do. It's just to kind of give it a different idea or a few different ideas of what angle you can approach the, um, this corpus from how you can use it in a classroom. And I, I misjudged how small this was, so I can actually, no, I'm not gonna, I'll, I'll read, I'll read these even though it's not always super my style. But if it's content driven, so that's saying, okay, next week you guys have an exam, y'all are gonna have to listen to fairly advanced audio, and this activity is hopefully gonna resemble it, but we're gonna slow down this activity and scaffold you so you feel like you can understand what the progression should be in your own mind, right? So some lesson characteristics of this might be the basic to advanced. Letting students understand what's going on in the basic conversation, once they feel confident and stable with that, making the conversation a little harder but not changing the actual content of it. And then they're more comfortable with the intermediate, they go over to the advanced, little by little steps, right? Maybe the line numbers where certain answers are kind of hidden, are indicated to students, okay? For question two, look at lines 17 through 19. Question four, the answer comes up in line three and line 40, whatever it is. And the traditional comprehension questions posed, but can be posed before, during, after. So maybe before, I could say, well, okay, when you guys listen, you'll hear Ignacio ask Jacqueline a question. I want you to note what that question is. Maybe that's the only thing they have to do the first time they listen. I don't know. And then maybe during, um, I, want, I want you to answer, is Jacqueline's answer a yes answer, a no answer, or a sometimes answer? And then after, maybe students paraphrase Jacqueline's answer to show that they comprehended it. And then maybe they write their own answer. Right? So that's students working with the content in a pretty traditional and superficial way. We're not talking deeply about that. how did you know the answer there? How did you know it was the right answer? None of that. Just, hey, who said what, when, and what's the answer to this fairly traditional question? Any other input or ideas on this? Because there's so many different things we could do. I'm like, oh, I can see what I could do in my class with this. If you're teaching six times. Just feel free to jump in if that's so. I, I think I will do the opposite instead of always going from basic to advanced. Mm -hmm. I'll want them to do the advanced and see what they can get. Mm -hmm. And then if they feel that they don't get it, they go mm -hmm. one level and then I will tell them, okay, try to get as much on this level and then go the opposite because if they already know with the basic, why would they want to advance do the advanced one? If they know the, the test is going to look like the advanced one. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I love starting with the advanced version in my class. That's usually what I end up doing. And I would say it's one of those things where there's not, you could almost argue the merit of any choice you make with any variable. With this, you're not going to use this kind of thing wrong, in my opinion. Um, so if it's metalinguistic, and that's something we do a lot in the Spanish and Portuguese department, right? Which is why heritage speakers tend to have trouble if they're not in a heritage track course, because they're not ready to answer things like, but why are we using sad and not sad? Why are we using this way of saying to be instead of that way? Um, so, so what ends up happening here is this is where students get to say, okay, this is that grammar I just learned. Or, oh yeah, that form needs to be there because of this. Right? And reflecting on, hey, this is basic and this is intermediate, and look at this difference that they made in form. Hey, I know that intermediate form, we just learned it. And I know that basic form too, but I learned it ages ago. Right? So students for this one might listen, these are possible, they might listen to shorter excerpts of the conversation at different levels, and they might work with multiple scripts at once. It might become less of an audio activity at some points, but if you want to make sure you're using audio, obviously you integrate the audio still. So possible prompts for students here. Okay, say, hey, you have the advanced, you have the intermediate. What are two differences? And whoever wrote these scripts, or whoever came up with this, why did they make those changes as it relates to the difficulty of the two levels? 
Or maybe you look at Jacqueline's turn, you write it in simplified Spanish. You base what she said in the advanced version or the intermediate version. You say, hey, take what she says, but rewrite it in as simple Spanish as you can for somebody who knows very, very little. And then they write it, and then they get to look at the basic script, and they see how similar it is. Not in a right or a wrong way, but in a hey. You could also say it this way, way. And then, what can you understand from the advanced script only by comparing it to the immediate script? Okay. What would the holes be in your comprehension if you didn't have the support from the slightly easier version? I like that. This is the one. This one and the next one are the ones I really like. Yes. Um, thank you. Any any other ideas as far as like that this kind of This is the meta-awareness <coughs> one, which I think a lot of times our students really do need some kind of gentle nudges with. Um, I think a lot of times we have very bright students who are very good at student doing school. And I think a lot of times cultivating the skills of reflecting on your own learning. When do I thrive? When do I struggle? How can I apply my skills to my areas of weakness to make them better? I think. In the years I've been at UT, I've realized part of that is my job to help them figure out how to do that. So that's basically what this is. They're cultivating their self-awareness. So maybe on this one, they do listen to the audio first without a script, and then they return to it again after working with the other versions. Right? For them to realize, hey, just because you didn't understand it 20 minutes ago doesn't mean you don't understand it now. Have, helping them go through that progression and talking about that progression. Um, and that actually relates to this. Um, oh, that reminds me of the next slide. And then a teacher offers think aloud or listen aloud. Right? Like I, I put on the audio, I stop it, and I'm like, well, that was confusing. That sounded really fast. Maybe I jot down on the dot cam a few words that I caught and just hypothesize a little bit about um, what the words were. Maybe I take some of the comprehension questions from that content-driven one, and I do a think aloud with those as well. Um, like we were saying at the beginning, it's a hard skill to observe, which means it's also a hard skill to model. So I think also taking the liberty to not just press play and wait for four minutes, but press play, say I'm going to stop this after 20 seconds, and we're going to talk about what we heard. Or I'm going to tell you what I heard, and I want to see if you agree is another way to make that visible. Um, over here to possible prompts. OK, which parts of Ignacio's turn are least important to understanding Jacqueline's first response and why? Because Ignacio is talking about his students using cell phones, and then he says to Jacqueline, do you have a technology addiction? One of those you really need to understand in order to understand Jacqueline's turn, and one you really don't. So figuring out the self-awareness the self of being able to let certain parts of conversation go Right? So that, because when we listen to people in our second language, we don't always catch 